the bones that accumulate in an archaeological site are the result by far the most important factor is that they are table remains. People have prepared the food and they have prepared the uh, meat to be served by chopping it up. But there are other kinds of remains that also uh, occur and they are the remains of what we call civilization followers. Civilization followers are animals that come as a result of they, they, are, they, they find food in so any like rats, rodents, certain birds, cats. cats, yes. And it should be said that cats and dogs that we identify as pets, in the, in, it, that's a very modern phenomena. These animals were not pets in the past. They were part of the natural um, cleanup system. They came, and it's like the dogs at the site. They are not friendly. They, they, are, they keep away from people. But they come there in order to, um, to eat the scraps from the table, okay? Now, there's another concept that I want to give you, which is a big word you can send out to your Facebook friends. And that is thanatosinosis. What is a thanatosinosis? It is a community in death. That is to say, all these different species come together and they end up dying and being in one place. So you might have, for example, a snake that's not normally a civilization follower, but it follows, it comes to the site because there are mice there. And the mice are there because the grain is there. And the grain is there because the humans are there. And so the, but, so the thanatosinosis is this combination of life that ends up uh, there because of the ecology. And so we have actually found a, a case of a snake with a mouse inside its body, which is exactly what I'm talking about. And so in zooarchaeology, or, uh, we are interested in many things. We are interested in, first of all, how the archaeological, uh, uh, what bones can tell us about people and the economy. And I'll say more about that. But we are also interested in what bones can tell us about the natural environment. What kinds of wild uh, species are present? Um, it should also be said that people hunt and what's available in the hunt, the, you know, hunted animals like wild boar are not civilization followers, but people go out and they shoot them and these wild animals that are there or, or especially in our area, uh, we have a lot of, uh, well, there, there's uh, gazelle, different kinds of gazelle. They're hunted for their meat. And so these animals, uh, they show up because of, of, of that process. So we want to know, you know, the animals can tell us about the natural environment because these different species have habits or habitats that are forested or open fields or it might be a, a species that thrive in, uh, in a very sandy environment. So again, the species become a clue to the environment. Also, uh, this happens to be a mandible, lower jaw of a sheep. And we can learn something about the environment from actually looking at these teeth. Because we know this is a pretty young animal. And a young animal is supposed to have a nice line of healthy, sharp teeth. But if we in fact see a lot of wear here on a young animal, what do you suppose that might suggest? That they're having to uh, graze very close to the ground because of a very limited, uh, 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 a very dry conditions. And that tells you that this is a period of, of dryness. So again, that's just one example of how we, we can read the, the environment from the bones. Uh, so the bones are really a, a clue to so many things. The environment, changes in the environment, as well as changes in the economy. Now, in the, ba the most basic thing then in zooarchaeology is to separate out those species that are part of the domestic corpus. And what are the typical domestic animals that you would expect in a village life? Well, obviously you can look around here and you will surely expect sheep and goats. Cows. And cows. And then you will have what we call uh, tra anim traction animals, which would be uh, mule, donkey and horse. And uh, of course, cows were not kept for milk. They were also really kept for traction in the past. Uh, the milk was secondary. And then camel for transportation. 
Then in addition, a very important species that we have, and I see there's a, well actually I haven't seen any, yes, here it is. This is a, this is a small bone of a chicken. Now chicken is, uh, is found because they are actually a very, very efficient meat producer. And especially when you get a concentration of people in a town, it's wonderful to have chickens because they eat everything. And they make eggs. And you can slaughter them and eat them. And I mean, it's like, it's the most natural thing to have chickens. Because they just, and the other animal actually that, that's like that is pigs. They don't require a big pasture. They will eat anything that you put before them. And so they, again, are a very practical animal for people. And especially as land gets scarce, people get more, have more and more chicken and, and pigs. And they may not have time to go follow the animals. Then it's very practical to just have some, we call those the barnyard animals, right? So I'm just talking about the processes that bring these animals together. But by far the most dominant thing that we find when we do faunal analysis in this part of the world are the bones of sheep and goat. They represent probably close to 90% of the material. And that makes it fairly easy to become at least a modestly familiar with the material that uh, is here. Now, I think this is possibly from your field. This was in, mixed in with the pottery and you're collecting both bones. And uh, so Peter has been collecting both. I separated out these bones because I wanted to just see what exactly was coming up in Peter's field. And it's an interesting little collection here. Uh, immediately, I ended up with a piece of pottery there um, and there. But anyhow, these I can immediately see do not belong to the sheep family, but everything else pretty much does. And so here I have quickly, well this is from a larger animal. Just quickly check it here. It's pottery again. Okay, now looking at this you'd say, well what, how do you know this is sheep and goat? Well, you, we actually, uh, have at the dig house and most zooarchaeologists they check their work by means of a comparative collection. What's a comparative collection? It is a collection of bones that have uh, that, that are in a sense the, the template. So you have a whole bone, a whole a femur of a sheep and then you can look at that whole piece and then see how the a broken piece fits to the whole. And, but you soon learn what are the common ones. But to do a complete analysis the way I typically do it is I, in the field, I try to do the initial reading of all the she, all the, the common animals. And then when I find something that is not common, that is to say maybe I find the bone of a, of a lion or of a deer or something that is extraordinary, I like to separate that out. But the rest then uh, uh, I, I will just simply call. Now, that too should go over here. Okay, so here we have a, 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 a mix of things. Um, there are quite a few teeth parts. And by the way, what survives? Well, most it's the hardest elements that survive. And so you can expect that the ends of bones are, are more likely to survive than the shafts. And all, all uh, mammals, I should also say, have long bones. We call those, it's your uh, you know, humerus and your femur and your uh, tibia and ulna. The interesting thing about these bones is that they have three parts, all long bones. They have a proximal end, proximal meaning that it's close to the body, and distal meaning far away, distant from the trunk. So the distal end, or the proximal end. This is the distal end. Now, and then you have the shaft in between. Now, in a young animal, these distal and proximal ends are, are uh, three bones held together by cartilage. And that's what makes a young person so flexible because they're still not hardened. But the process of hardening takes only a few months in, in smaller animals and in larger animals within a year or two. But you, therefore, if you find um, a, a distal end of a uh, metapodial, which is what I have here, and this thing is separate, then you know you have an, a young animal. And um, we are very interested in this as zooarchaeologists because people harvest their animals for different purposes. If you are, are they having a race in this street? You wonder. Okay. <laughs> if you are racing animals for meat in the market, what, how, how long would you likely, if your primary goal is to sell the meat, are you going to grow the animal to full? 
No. Likely, the, 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 if you're growing for sale of the meat, it'll be a younger animal. If you're primarily growing the sheep and goat for milk, then they will, be, they will live as long as they can. So they are older animals. So again, you can see how you can tell the orientation of the meat production system from the, from the age of the animals. Uh, also, we, we, can, uh, uh, we can tell on certain bones, such as this, this is the uh, pelvis of a sheep, the, bo the bone that, uh, in the hip bone. And in, in, um, in, 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 in certain, in the, we, we can, with, with expertise, you can separate the pelvis in this part by the thickness of this little structure right here from whether it's a goat or a sheep. The problem of separating sheep and goat is a big problem. And the people that pioneered that work were Bosnick and Fondenwick, the team that came to Hespan back in the 70s. They have written extensively on that subject. And when they came and we worked at that school in Amman I told you about, they separated out a, a sheep from goat on many more animals than I did. I simply just call it sheep goat because I can't, I, 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 have, I have not kept up with the field. But an expert would be able to tell you exactly you have so many goats, so many sheep, and the proportion matter. More likely, if, uh, if you have more goats, goats have a very different function in the, in the economy. They, can, they are also much more omnivorous. They eat leaves off of trees. They eat garbage, whereas sheep are quite fussy. They like to eat nice grass. And so if you have good conditions, you have more sheep. But if you have bad conditions uh, in the environment, you'll likely have more goats. Goats are hardier. And they, f they provide a certain uh, assurance against bad times. So if you're looking at bad times, you'll want to have more goats. But if they're good times, you'll have more sheep. So it's interesting to know the difference. Okay, so here I'm just going to go through and tell you why I, I, I keep these. So this is, now this is a young animal. This is a, a, a um, scapula of a young sheep. I don't have here a scapula to show you. The scapula is this back here, you know. But it's a very young animal. You can see it's just barely, barely fused here. So this is a small, young, young one. Uh, this actually goes there. This is uh, likely part of the um, femur. This is a tooth again. Uh, these are all this, and this is, um, this is actually a small phalange, uh, the, the third phalange, the final phalange in a little sheep. And that probably goes with this guy. Here we have another. Now, I just showed you, uh, this is the bottom part of the pelvis. It comes up like this. It's not the same animal, but I mean the same bone, but it is, it, it, I, I can immediately tell from the structure again that this is the pelvis of, of a sheep or goat. Okay, so I'll just go through here now quickly and um, see what I have. There we have something a little different. Of course, this is the mandible here. Talked about that. That's a bird. This is a bird. Okay, so what I do in my, quote, bone reading is I want to give you an initial idea of what you have in your collection. This is not the final analysis. This is just the initial analysis. And so uh, I'll count up now and tell you that I have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Sixty nine sheep goat. And then here we have, this is definitely a um, metapodial of a cow. And this uh, is actually part of a vertebra or something of a, of a cow. Actually, I'm sorry, I would take that back. 
I, I would posit that this could be a human. Uh, th this is uh, possibly a tibia of a human. Is that coming up in your field? Yeah, th uh, yeah, this is your collection. This is from where you are. This could be. This is definitely the, fir uh, the second metapodial, of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the f second phalange of a cow. This is a, a molar of a, c of a cow. These are hard to call, but they're probably, they're, I would call them a large mammal, and they likely belong to a cow. So I would say three um, cattle or cow, and then four, lar four large mammal, one possible human, and then one, two, three, four, five. I would call these simply, at this point, bird. They're very likely chicken, but they're not, um, Without a comparative collection, I couldn't say for sure. So if you were, now what happens next? So I've done this call, and I think the way it works is that there's a card in here, but in your case, you, haven't, you actually haven't uh, done a separate bag, but what you should do now is to write down on the, under remarks what I've just said, and then you can put down three cow, four L, M, which is large mammal, and five bird. There you are. And so that, with the slip put inside, concludes the bone reading for this particular field. That goes back in the bag there. And now that's been read. And that, is, that then represents uh, a preliminary reading that when you now go to interpret your finds, you'll find that some fields, just the fact that you have a lot of bones is information. And to be able to know that you have a certain kind of composition of bones can help you interpreting the, that particular square.